what better way to experience the E3 press conferences than through the lens of two utterly miserable people? Streaming live on twitch.tv slash TotalBiscuit over the E3 weekend, myself and Jenna will be covering, riffing on, and generally pissing on the parade of the big E3 press conferences. Check out the schedule on the screen right now and tune in live. Uncut VODs available immediately for Twitch subscribers and Supercut videos coming to youtube.com slash cynicalbrit. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Let us talk about things that are like Rogue. Or more specifically, not like Rogue. Let us talk instead perhaps about Rogue Light. It is of course possible to discuss the concept of Rogue Light without talking about Rogue Like, the reason that the term even exists in the first place. It's a game genre that has a very clear history that can be traced all the way back to Rogue, unsurprisingly, hence the name and yet is constantly misused, in my honest opinion, to the detriment of accurately describing what a game is. Thankfully, over the past few years, there has been a term that has started to shove this misused genre descriptor out of discussion, which as far as I'm concerned, a good thing. I do like discussing things in a way that is accurate to reality, and the misuse of words and terms in every discussion, gaming, certainly not excluded, is a problem for having a good discussion in the first place. The term roguelite is very relevant to anybody that games a lot on PC. You'll have probably noticed over the past few years we have covered a great deal of roguelite titles, some of which I really enjoyed and made my top 10 games of the year, some of which I didn't. It is seemingly impossible to be a PC gamer these days without seeing a game that claims to be roguelite or more egregiously in some cases roguelike, every few weeks pop up on the Steam store, and quite a lot of them get a good amount of attention. There was a time when many of these games were receiving hefty Kickstarter backing, and I don't think we have passed the time as of yet where adding rogue light components to your game is a selling point. That said, there are a lot of misunderstandings as to what rogue light is, whether or not it's even a genre in the first place, where it came from, and how to implement it correctly. In order to talk about that, I'd like to first talk about roguelike, and then the definition of genre when applied to video games specifically, and talk about why the video game medium is quite distinct amongst other forms of media when it comes to the concept of genre and how it's described. And then, of course, I can talk about roguelite, what makes a roguelite, what does not, and what makes a good roguelite, more to the point. So let's start with roguelikes. They are not the same as roguelites. They have not been for a very long time. But for a while, roguelike elements or roguelike components, or just flat out calling a game roguelike, was used in place of what we now know as roguelite. The thing is that roguelike has a pretty well-defined definition, and that definition is called the Berlin Interpretation. It was created at the International Roguelike Development Conference in 2008. It was a discussion amongst all the attendees there, developers and aficionados of this particular genre, and they came up with a set of criteria, not all of which has to be adhered to, but most of which must be included in order for a game to be properly defined as a roguelike. The history of roguelikes, of course, goes back to Like Rogue, the game Rogue, and there are famous games within that genre like Angband, Crawl, NetHack, and Ancient Domains of Masochism. There are still roguelikes made today, but in my opinion, bearing in mind that I do agree very much with the Berlin interpretation, roguelike is a specific genre. It's not a term you can just toss onto anything, and it does have a set of important components and requirements that are well defined through the history of the genre. There is great precedent for saying this. This was not simply pulled out of the arse of everybody that attended. So with the Berlin interpretation, what you have are high value and low value factors. The high value factors include random environment generation, permadeath, a turn-based nature, a grid-based nature, and a few vaguer concepts such as the idea of complexity, difficulty, resource management, hack and slash style gameplay. Of perhaps surprise to some people is what's included in the low value factors, particularly the idea of an ASCII display. 
traditional roguelike games such as NetHack and Angband presented the world and the things within it with ASCII characters. So the player character may very well be an at sign. You'll be fighting uppercase P's and lowercase L's and so on and so forth. And really, the reason for that was technological limitations of the time. You're talking about a procedurally generated dungeon that's different every time, filled with a wide variety of items and monsters, without the processing power and, indeed, artistic ability to properly represent that with real graphics, as it were. So, back then, of course, they were represented that way. It is a low-value factor for a very good reason, because graphical evolution is something that happens very naturally with genres as we advance in terms of technology and capability. They generally do not define the genre. That's very rare. A first-person shooter does not require a certain aesthetic, but it does require a first-person perspective. That would be a high-value factor in the definition of that genre. Other low-value factors include the concept of tactical challenge, the idea of having numbers on the screen, there being dungeons and a single character, then not that important. But these other high value factors very much are. And you can clearly define a game by using this interpretation and these factors. Now, the reason why this is important, and the reason that I reject any argument that says that we should not hold both the roguelike genre and indeed any genre to relatively strict definitions is because as you dilute a genre by making it vaguer, by making it less descript and accurate, you simultaneously lose the value of describing it as such to begin with. Accurate genre descriptions are a very important tool for the consumer and necessary in a world where we are drowning in video games. There are too many games, nobody could ever possibly keep track of them all. It's getting worse all the time in that respect. And due to the amount of consumer choice, consumers must be more discerning and be able to figure out what they may be interested in at a glance. Accurate genre descriptors are a key way to do this. So if you take the concept of roguelike, but then take away the key aspects of what makes a roguelike a roguelike and has defined it over the course of 20 plus years, then you throw the usefulness of a genre description completely out of the window. It's surprising to see so many people act in such a sensitive manner when it comes to this kind of thing, even down to the concept of calling something a game. I believe there has to be a definition of sorts to describe what a game is. It doesn't have to be a very restrictive one, but it does have to be accurate. And you'd be surprised how many people have really got offended at the notion that something may not be a game. It's entirely fine for something not to be a game. It's entirely fine for something not to be part of a particular genre. One would think that any developer would want happy consumers, that they would want people to discover their product who have a predisposition to be interested and invested in it. But sometimes that's not the case, whether it be simply down to delusion, personal ego, or indeed the deliberate intention to mislead, ride on the coattails of something else, fool somebody into checking your game out. And while I can understand that discoverability is very much a problem in modern gaming, that's not the way to do it. That's a way to anger a lot of people. Now, the thing that really interests me when it comes to roguelike as a genre description is that it's extremely indicative of how we treat genres in the video game medium. And honestly, that is quite different to other forms of media. And I do believe there is a very good reason for that. Now, when it comes to genre, genre in and of itself has a fairly loose definition. Genre is a category of artistic composition, characterized by similarities in form, style, or subject matter. Now, when it comes to games, we do still use that definition of genre, but I have noticed that there is a fairly severe slant towards the form of a product as opposed to the theme of a product. There is a very good reason for that. That is not simply something that happened by chance. It happened by necessity due to the nature of how we interface with and experience this medium. If you think about how genre is applied to, say, film, you will notice that theme is often front and center when it comes to genre description. It is highly prioritized. This is by no means universally true, but I'm talking about referring to films as sci-fi or war 
or fantasy. These are descriptions that are often front and center on big name movies and they focus on the setting, the theme. What they don't focus on is the form, even the notion of the mechanics of a movie, which is an odd description, isn't it? Because it is a non-interactive medium. But we do often skip describing a movie in that way entirely, but not always. Horror in particular, or tragedy, or comedy, these very much describe the form and how the audience will generally be expected to interact with it. A horror movie is designed to scare people, elicit fear. A comedy, elicit laughter. If you wanted to be truly accurate, however, when it comes to those kind of discussions, you would add to that genre description something about the theme. A sci-fi horror. A fantasy comedy, etc, etc. That's a more useful description, because while some people will say, oh, I like sci-fi. Well, in my case, if I say that, and then I walk into a movie like Event Horizon, having only been told it's sci-fi, I will hate my time there because I don't like horror. I actively dislike it. And yet we do see movies very much described in that way. With non-interactive media, there's more of a balance between the two when it comes to how they're described. But yet with interactive media, that being video games, focus is put on form. It's put on mechanics, on the construction of the game and how you interface with it as a player. And indeed, how could it not? Games are fundamentally interactive, and as a direct result, there are always going to be ways in which you interact. Games are fundamentally limited in this respect as to how you directly interact with them. A first-person shooter involves shooting things in first person. As to whether or not it is a fantasy game, a sci-fi game, a steampunk game, or anything along those lines, those concerns are really secondary. And the reason for that is that interaction with the product is so important and it can be such a barrier to enjoying said product that the mechanics of the game and the form has to come front and center. It is the priority. It is the most important component. It's inescapable. You can't get away from that notion of interactivity and interface. The idea that the player is a absolutely vital part of the experience and the experience in that form cannot exist without them. As a direct result of this, when it comes to genres such as roguelike, this is why it is primarily defined by mechanics, not by theme, not by how it looks, but how it plays. Now, this is where things start to get, at least for me, probably not for anybody else, kind of interesting. Roguelike is a genre. Roguelite isn't. And you might be asking, well, why? What's the difference between the two? Are they not merely a set of characteristics, a bundle of mechanics? Well, that really comes down to how specific you want to get when dealing with the concept of mechanics versus vaguer things like design philosophy and overall direction. Playing a roguelike forces a very particular form of interaction with the player, whereas playing a roguelite does not. Roguelite, in its current form, is a little bundle of ideas that can be applied to pretty much any genre. And that has been proven without a doubt over the past few years of roguelite game development. Now, what you may not know is that roguelite didn't just come out of nowhere. There is really not a valid argument as to where roguelite came from. It is provable. And I'll tell you exactly where it came from. It came from Rogue Legacy. The developers of that title coined the term. It's been on their Steam Store page and indeed any pre-release promotional material. And that term does not exist on the internet prior to Rogue Legacy. I know because I checked. I looked through Google's history. I checked things like search trends, popularity, when that term started being used. It is unequivocally the result of Rogue Legacy. This is why the term sprung up in 2013 around the release of Cellador Games title. They came up with that phrase. They came up with the term. And as a direct result of that, because Rogue Legacy is the father of this term, that is the game that, as far as I'm concerned, gets to define what this bundle of ideas is. It is the game by which we look at everything else that claims to be roguelite and determine whether or not it actually is roguelite. So what is roguelite? 
It's not a genre. We know this because of how many other genres Rogue Light has been applied to. Here is my definition of Rogue Light, and I will explain why I believe this after I've told you what it is. Rogue Light is a set of three design principles that must exist within a game in order for it to be Rogue Light. These three pillars of Rogue Light are as follows. One, a degree of procedural generation. A roguelike game must contain some randomly generated element in order for it to be roguelite. This is a high value component of the Berlin definition of roguelike, and that is the reason why we call it roguelite in the first place. You can trace that genealogy all the way back. That exists for that reason. The second pillar for a roguelite is permadeath of some sort. Your character must die in that form and stay dead in that form in order for a game to be roguelite. Again, that is a high value pillar of the Berlin interpretation of roguelike. The third pillar, and the one that is most often misused, in my opinion, and yet is essential, is the concept of meta progression. Progression on an account level, as it were. The idea that each run contributes to the potential for permanent progression or unlocks. Now this of course has nothing to do with roguelikes and is one of the key reasons why it's so vastly different. Why exactly is this there, you might ask? Well, that goes back to who coined the term. Rogue Legacy did it, and a key component up front and center and even in the title is the legacy aspect of that game. The idea that when you die, permadeath, you take the earnings of the previous run and they are invested in something which lasts longer than that character. Something that is there permanently. That is a key component of Rogue Legacy in which you took the money that you earned for the previous run, you invested it into your estate, and that gave you either unlocks or advantages in the next run or just increased the overall variety of the game. It gave you access to content that was previously unavailable. Without that element, roguelite cannot exist, because without rogue legacy, roguelite does not exist, and that component is too important to ignore. If you leave it out, as far as I'm concerned, your game is not roguelite. It's not merely rogue legacy that defines that, despite the fact it has a great deal of influence being the game that coined it, there's a pretty clear history of these three design principles being used. Notice I don't say mechanics. There are mechanics within all of these principles, and yet they are not in and of themselves mechanics. The way that you do the permanent progression on the account level consists of a bundle of mechanics that can be implemented in different ways, but the principle remains the same. Permadeath can be handled differently, the way that something is procedurally generated and the degree to which it is procedurally generated can also have fundamental ties into the game mechanics, but is a principle in and of itself. I think it's important to pull back from calling it a genre simply because there is such a massive variance in the kinds of games that are described as roguelite and the personal preferences required to enjoy those products. Roguelike can be applied to things that I love and also things that I really don't. There are a lot of roguelite platformers. Rogue Legacy was one of them. I don't generally like platformers, and if it is a roguelite platformer, it's fairly likely that I will not enjoy it. I need to know that up front. If you just tell me your game is a roguelite, that isn't useful to me, because I can name just as many roguelites I didn't enjoy as ones that I did, and it wasn't simply down to how well the game did that particular genre. It came down to the genre itself. There are roguelite first-person shooters, there are roguelite third-person shooters, there are roguelite top-down twin-stick shooters, there are roguelite platformers, as we've mentioned, there are roguelite space combat and Six Degrees of Freedom games. It would require someone with very wide taste to enjoy all of those genres, and nobody enjoys them all equally. They may very well 
enjoy the principles behind a roguelite, which is why it's important to mention it, or they may very well despise it. That's also quite important. These games are generally quite difficult, but one of the things that we know of all roguelites is that once you're done with a run, that run is over. Their permadeath aspect is important. How you implement that is not necessarily the same, but it has to be there in some respect. Even a game in which you have multiple characters, such as Darkest Dungeon, which is a roguelite turn-based dungeon crawler, you still have permadeath of individual characters, just not your only character. You just happen to have more than one. It's still there. It's just mitigated by the fact that it's not the only character that you have. Whether or not your average consumer is likely to purchase a game on the basis of the three pillars of roguelite is, I think, less likely than their desire or lack thereof to purchase it based on its genre or its theme. A steampunk roguelite or a sci-fi roguelite or a cosmic horror roguelite or a first-person roguelite, third-person, top-down, twin-stick, all more important than the fact that they are roguelite in and of themselves. Remember when we said earlier that the way that you interact with the product is the priority when it comes to genre descriptions in video games? That is why. While the three pillars have an effect on that, they are not of primary importance in that respect. Very much tertiary aspects of those titles. Now, the question is, what makes a good roguelite? We've seen many popular examples of roguelite games over the past four years, many of which have been successful, or at least notable in some way. Rogue Legacy, of course, was highly successful. Games such as Binding of Isaac, Enter the Gungeon, Nuclear Throne, these are games that are very popular examples of this group of games, but they're also a little less experimental when it comes to the actual genre. As these ideas and pillars have grown over time, they've been applied to more unusual genres. We have seen the rise of FPS roguelites, we have seen the rise of turn-based strategy roguelites, things such as FTL, Renowned Explorers, Immortal Redneck, Ziggurat, and so on and so forth are all examples of the roguelite principles being applied to increasingly complicated and perhaps more difficult to handle genres when it comes to those three ideas. And I think no genre has been more fraught with problems when it comes to implementing the first pillar of roguelite, that being procedural generation, than the first person shooter. When we were talking about roguelikes earlier in the video, I mentioned that ASCII graphics were necessary at the time due to limited computational power. If you wanted to randomly generate a world every time, which is difficult to do well, then that's going to be even more challenging if you then have to make it look like a world that was put together by somebody that wasn't a robot. Procedural generation has been perhaps a bit of a golden goose that's been chased over the last 10 years in particular, but of course it's been around for far longer than that. It's powered increasingly complex and more graphically intensive games as of late, and as it did, many of those flaws in the notion of procedural generation really started to show. It's much, much easier to see the problems of computer-generated worlds when you take away the obfuscation of more abstract graphics, or indeed genres that are simply less reliant on good level design. When you're in the thick of it in a first-person shooter, that poor level design is far more noticeable than it would be in perhaps a top-down twin stick. And even when dealing with a genre in which level design is very important, such as a platformer, it is perhaps easier to procedurally generate a good platformer than it is to generate a good-looking first-person shooter. This is one of the key things that often hamstrings roguelite FPS, such as Immortal Redneck, Wasted, Tower of Guns, and titles like that. They have some great ideas behind them, but implementing those ideas well within that genre, particularly a genre that is so well-established and defined, is very challenging. You can compare a roguelite first-person shooter to a regular first-person shooter, and you can very clearly see what most of those traditional FPS do better. It's not necessarily something that can't be overcome, and there are games that have come close. I think Ziggurat is the closest, 
although it still has some faults, no doubt. But they are more difficult to overcome when compared to these titans of the genre that have been around for sometimes decades. The problem of roguelite is that, especially when dealing with those more problematic genres, its roguelite aspects are often used more as a crutch than they are as an enhancement. I get onto the idea of what makes a good roguelite. Well, you could make the argument that a good roguelite is a title in which you can take all of those elements out and yet have the game stand on its own two feet as a great game in and of its own right. But I think that that is a little too restrictive and short-sighted. Because in reality, if you're going to incorporate something into a product, it should enhance the overall experience to make it more than the sum of its parts. If you just take that ingredient away, sure, it can stand on its own, but would it not have been significantly better if we had implemented that aspect and done it well? On the flip side, of course, if you throw an ingredient into a recipe that isn't needed or clashes with the other ingredients, it can actively bring down the dish which happens more often than not when dealing with roguelike games. So I would go to say that, yes, a good roguelite should in and of itself have mechanics and a great core gameplay loop that can stand on its own if you took away those aspects of permadeath, procedural generation, and account level permanent progression. But the addition of those three aspects enhances the product beyond what it could have otherwise been without them it elevates it to a whole new level. Now, when I talk about the use of roguelite as a crutch, you can take all three of those pillars and you can quite clearly see where they could be used to prop up a title that otherwise has weaknesses. They can be used to hide said weaknesses, try to bury them, try to obfuscate them, or distract the player. Permadeath's probably the easiest aspect of roguelites to identify as a potential crutch. It fundamentally limits the amount of time that you can spend on one particular run in the game. It removes the need to create a continuous 20-hour experience and all of the trappings that come with that, whether it be design challenges, pacing, storytelling, or something as simple as budget. It's relatively cheap to create a title that is designed to be played for no more than 20 minutes in a particular sitting. Of course, you can just go and play another run, but you don't have to create an experience that has a defined beginning, middle, and end when it comes to many aspects of the game itself. Permanent Death is a very arcade-like principle. It's something that harks back to the days before continues and save states. It was used at the time to limit the player's ability to reach the end of the experience. We demand a lot more from our games these days when it comes to longevity. And permadeath is a way of getting that and without necessarily developing the content that would be required to otherwise achieve it. It's a little bit of a cheat and it is more often than not used in that way. That ties handily into another pillar of roguelite procedural generation. That too is used to avoid creating a lot of content as the developer, doing a lot of the busy work, making sure that you are handcrafting every part of the experience. And in doing so, it can create a potentially unlimited experience, although it's always going to be held back by the limitations of the software. And more often than not, we notice that procedural generation is best used in procedural moderation. It's important to put that hand-designed flair in there to balance what would otherwise be a bloody mess in many circumstances. I'm sure many of us remember some of the nonsense that went on in No Man's Sky and how procedural generation more often than not did not result in interesting worlds and creatures. No, it did not. It did the exact opposite. So we are noticing that a lot of the more successful roguelike games do hold back and temper the procedural generation with some hand created stuff whether it be more often than not in level design or indeed in the aspect of designing loot you can make a lot of very boring items there's no point in having a bazillion guns if the vast majority of them are dull and just minor variations on each other putting a little bit of human into the massive procedurally generated sludge is often vitally important
plenty of games we've seen have simply avoided doing that and used procedural generation as a crutch to avoid designing good levels. Again, a lot of roguelite first-person shooters have suffered from this. I don't think Tower of Guns designed good levels. I don't think Immortal Redneck did. I don't think Strafe did either. These were things that actively impeded my enjoyment of those games. The third pillar is maybe the least obvious when it comes to the use as a crutch, and yet it is very much there. Permanent progression unlocks, or indeed, an increase in the power of your character on a permanent level. There's a couple of ways that you can use this as a crutch. You can use this, of course, to drip feed content to the player. I mean, that's indeed the whole point. It can artificially increase the longevity. It can keep the game feeling fresher for a lot longer than it otherwise would. And of course, it can dip into the realms of the Skinner box, constantly drip feeding little treats to the player to keep them on the hook for more. This is not inherently malicious. It's indeed core to the roguelite experience. It's required, but it can be misused. That gating of content can create artificial longevity that doesn't really deserve to be there and can certainly have a very negative effect on pacing. It can also be used as a little bit of a crutch when dealing with the idea of a well-balanced difficulty curve. Some roguelike games use the permanent progression aspect to power up your next character in some way. Naturally, this can make the game easier. What would be the point otherwise? If your character gets progressively more powerful and yet the monsters keep up with you, you don't necessarily notice that increase in power. Although, some games manage to do that very well by increasing your level of power but increasing the capabilities of monsters without just directly pumping up their stats to match yours. And very well designed roguelites do that. Indeed, so do games outside of the roguelite sphere. That said, a well-balanced difficulty curve is key to good game design. And it is possible to sidestep the concept of teaching players concepts and skills, things that they can naturally evolve over play, by simply pumping up the stats of the player to compensate. It's not necessarily often done, and quite a few roguelites elect to either just have variety unlocks, which is a perfectly valid way of doing it, or side grades and choices which maybe have some disadvantages, but there are definitely some games that do it, and some don't do it all that well. Games in particular that combine the notion of starting off at the lowest point you will ever be in terms of stats, and also the lowest point in skill that you will ever be, because you are new to the game, are those that are guilty of this the most. I noticed it quite recently in Everspace, a game that on its normal or hard difficulty is very challenging and punishing, and yet gets progressively easier over time because you unlock perks which are just flat increases in power. This can often create a nasty difficulty spike at the very start of the game, a barrier that must be overcome. That can cause some players just to tap out quite early. Considering how often players don't finish games these days, that happens more than you might think. Particularly with the two-hour refund and trial culture of Steam, the last thing you want to do is bounce a player put a player off within the first couple of hours. And that is very possible when you use that kind of permanent progression. The flip side, of course, is also very possible and often true. The game just gets too easy. As you progress in skill, you also progress in power to the point where the game simply doesn't provide a meaningful challenge to you anymore. So it ends up being a little bit dull. There is the risk of both. Now, when it comes to making a good roguelite, I think there are some very important aspects that are tied into these three pillars that must have careful attention paid to them during development. One of the key aspects of any video game is the concept of the core gameplay loop. This is the concept of the repetitive actions that you are taking during the majority of your play. And these repetitive actions are, for the most part, how you meaningfully interact with the game itself. This loop has to be good in Almost every game, I think. For me in particular, who's very mechanically focused, I think a game without a good core loop is very unlikely to impress me. But of course, there are many ways to enjoy a game, and more often than not, you'll find people who are very story-focused that are not so bothered by that loop. For me, though, it is very important, but with roguelites in particular, it is more important than the average game. Why? Well, 
you've got to look back at the pillars for the answer to that. The game is procedurally generated, which often means that it can be quite limited mechanically. How you interact with the world is limited by the way that the world is designed. And when you take design away from the world by putting it into the hands of a computer and an algorithm, then you can limit the ways in which those interactions can occur. Which means that those interactions are often the tried and true, simple methods of interacting with video games. The most prominent of those is, of course, the concept of killing an enemy. Is there a roguelike game in existence that does not have the defeat of an enemy in some form? Not that I'm aware of. It's not a requirement, but it makes the most sense. You're dealing with factors that can fundamentally limit what you can do within the game and how the game is created. And of course, there are numerous advantages to doing that, but yeah, there are limitations. So yes, interaction with entities within the world is usually done through violence, and it's the easiest way to do so in a way that makes sense. Now, the reason why core gameplay loop is so important in the roguelite is the pillar of permadeath. The fact of the matter is, your runs are going to be limited in time, and you're often going to be going back to the start, or somewhere prior to where you were previously. It's a new run, some of your progress is erased with the death of your character. That means that you're going to be doing the same thing, you're going to be perhaps fighting the same enemies, probably not going through the same areas because of procedural generation, but there'll probably be aspects of that. Maybe the same tile sets or the same theme of the level. As a result of this, there are very repetitive aspects of roguelites. Indeed, a core aspect of a roguelite is the aspect of repetition. As a result, the game has to stand up to that repetition. Repetitive actions are the core gameplay loop, ergo the loop must be good in order to keep you interested. Other aspects that may prop up other video games, perhaps such as the narrative and fundamental choices that you make in said narrative, don't really exist in roguelike games, so you can't rely on them to otherwise save the experience. Now regardless of the fact that these games are fundamentally based on the principle of runs and permadeath, generally fairly short runs comparative to other games, pacing is surprisingly important when it comes to roguelites. You might think it really isn't, considering the procedurally generated nature, which naturally is something that works against the concept of pacing. Pacing is generally a very human element, it's baked into the design, and yet you are expecting the game to be well paced without being a linear experience like other games are. A well paced book keeps the intrigue and interest going from page 1 to page 300, and yet there is no real end page for the vast majority of roguelites. Even when you end the game, you don't, and the game absolutely stands up to replay because those three pillars all feed into the concept of replay. And yet pacing is important, and it's more often than not governed by the third pillar, that being the permanent progression. The rate at which you unlock new content, or advance your character on a more permanent level, is tied inherently into pacing. If it's too slow, knocks the whole pacing of the game off. If it's too fast, can do the same sort of thing can fundamentally affect the difficulty curve, as we mentioned earlier, and of course, your level of interest. You've got to constantly keep giving somebody something new to play with. Otherwise, yes, the game can get boring. Despite the aspect of permadeath inherent in roguelites, I feel a game should always respect the player's time. And while any game with permadeath and that inherent level of perhaps unfairness can very much not do that, the best ones do. And that third pillar, that permanent progression, allows for that to happen. It allows for you to feel as if you have done something and what you just did counted for something. Do that well and you can have somebody endure a thousand deaths. Do it poorly, they're quitting out after less than ten. A lack of respect for players' time combined with a poor core gameplay loop is usually the reason why I would stop playing a video game, in almost all circumstances. Every roguelite that I have disliked has been weak on both counts, without a doubt. One of the most interesting things about roguelite is the idea of what I like to call potential and kinetic energy. 
roguelites are dealing in both simultaneously. You have the potential energy buildup of the permanent progression and the kinetic energy of a single, relatively short run. There's a flurry of action followed by the relative calm before the next storm, and both must function well in order for the game to be good, in order for the game to maintain interest. One could certainly be weaker than the other, and almost always is, but for the survival of the game, they must both at least be serviceable. A good roguelite will have the kinetic energy of an enjoyable run, that after it ends you will look back and say, I felt like I really enjoyed myself and was very fulfilled by this, but will also incorporate the additional satisfaction of a more tangible reward for that run. Something permanent, something objective, an unlock or a stat upgrade. Do both of those things and you have titles that can entertain for thousands of hours. And there are indeed plenty of examples of games that have done just that. The question I suppose therefore becomes, what's the best roguelite? What is the best example? It's a pretty hard question, simply because as I mentioned, roguelite can be applied to so many different genres. The answer to what's the best first person shooter is not Tetris. And yet within roguelite we have so many different genres coming together. They all of course have their strengths and subjective preference plays a heavy role. But based on everything that I've just said, trappings to avoid, aspects of the three pillars to exemplify, to elevate the product above what it could otherwise be, to create more than the sum of its parts. Right now, despite having really enjoyed a whole bunch of games that call themselves roguelite over the past few years in a wide variety of genres, I'm sitting here staring at Dead Cells and I'm looking at a game which may very well exemplify all three of those pillars better than anything else. Despite being an early access, Dead Cells is a game that I have described publicly as taking all of the things that I don't like about roguelite and fixing them. All of them. Everything that I've mentioned. All of these frustrations that I bring up not only in this video but in the countless other videos that I've made on roguelite games. None of them are present within Dead Cells. They simply do not exist. And even the ones that I don't necessarily enjoy all that much or just have the tendency to dislike due to their common implementation are done better in Dead Cells. Dead Cells says yes, we do indeed have that permanent progression pillar with unlocks. And yet, on top of that, what we have is a fundamentally engaging loot system that takes procedural generation into account by applying random affixes and suffixes which are all very interesting to these loot items. So not only have you unlocked a new weapon, but in doing so you've unlocked potentially infinite variations on that weapon as well. Variations that are interesting and engaging and change your playstyle and make every drop feel fresh. It's a game that makes me look forward to dying because I'm looking forward to my next run already. How does it do that? Well, it loads you up with some cool stuff right off the bat. You are powerful, you're not anemic, you're not pathetic at any point in that game. The enemies are powerful, but so are you. Many roguelike games use the three pillars as something of a crutch to hide otherwise underdeveloped mechanics. And the main form of interaction that I mentioned earlier in this video was, of course, violence. Killing enemies, defeating enemies. There are titles such as Binding of Isaac, in which I believe the basic combat system and the way you interact with enemies is overly simplistic and dull. That's a subjective opinion on my part. Many people enjoy Isaac, but they don't enjoy it for the basic attack, I would think. That's incredibly simple. They enjoy it for all of the things that roguelite piles on top of that basic attack. But to me, that's drowning a well-done steak in enough sauce to disguise the flavor. Dead Cells without all of those things has a really nice combat system, but with those things, it elevates it to an entirely new level. And it takes advantage of the concept of permadeath to say to you just one more run. I want to try again. I'm excited to try again. And that in itself also eliminates many of those repetitive aspects and ensures, of course, what I mentioned, a very strong core gameplay loop. Great combat in a combat-oriented game means great core gameplay loop. 
And that's what Dead Cells has in abundance. Procedural generation is used in an interesting way, and yet it does not override the human aspect of level design. They have combined the two and done so in a very effective way, and the levels absolutely look as if they were designed by a human being. They make logical sense, and even when there's maybe a little risk of that illusion being shattered, they had the common sense to implement things like teleporters to ensure that you're not treading over the same ground all that much. That's again another way of reducing the aspect of repetition, but also diluting one of the risks of procedural generation, the idea of dead ends. A lot of stuff that doesn't really lead anywhere. Well, when you have a bunch of teleporters and you can jump right back to the relevant part of the level, that ceases to be a factor. And we've seen more recent roguelites such as Enter the Gungeon implement that to great effect. That, of course, addresses another aspect, the respect of the player's time. The downtime in that game is essentially non-existent, and it likes to encourage you to move at a reasonable rate by having bonus doors that lock after a certain time. The game is full of interesting choices and viable playstyles. Every piece of gear that you pick up changes your way of fighting so radically that you're making a real choice whenever you pick something up. It's usually not just a case of something having higher stats than something else. More often than not, these items are offering instead a distinctly different playstyle that comes into play right as you equip and start to use the item. Passive stats, while very present and important, take second seat to that very visual, obvious, and unavoidable change in playstyle. Due to the effectiveness of pretty much every item in that game, you are not confronted with the game telling you that you're wrong. You are not confronted by the game shortchanging you or you feeling as if you got screwed. You get a fair shake every time. With a set of games that are more often than not associated with unfairness, that is a refreshing change. Perhaps one of the most important aspects that I love about Dead Cells that has hamstrung other games is the idea that the game does not ever screw you from the start. Other games have done that. It is possible to have a run that you may as well just abandon. This is far more prevalent in games that are less reliant on mechanical skill and more reliant on simple numbers. The more reliant a game is on numbers, the more likely you can get screwed through no fault of your own. Dead Cells being less reliant on such things, naturally avoids that and it's not a game that seems to revel in making things unnecessarily or frustratingly difficult it revels in a fair challenge in a feeling of power confronting powerful enemies there are so many good things about that game even in its current unfinished state i am absolutely loving my time with it and if this game is not used as a template for future roguelite titles even if they are not in the same genre the 2D action platform of Roller that Dead Cells most certainly is, they could take a lot of design philosophy lessons from the folks over at Motion Twin, the developers of Dead Cells. Roguelite is not something we're going to see go away anytime soon. It's something that could fall out of fashion, as many things have a tendency to do, but because it is a set of design ideas, principles, philosophies and not a set of mechanics it can't inherently age it can't inherently become obsolete the reasons why people like these games will always be there to a greater or lesser degree they may go out of fashion they may come back into fashion but they'll always be relevant their prevalence at the moment may very well come down to the business realities of the industry as well as consumer taste, which is in many ways dictated by said business realities. Roguelike games can be cheaper to produce, they can be made by smaller teams, and they can have some really interesting ideas while avoiding some costly, time-consuming, and indeed very daunting development challenges that may very well be out of the reach of a newer team. They can be developed on lower budgets, they can be developed by single people, and more often than not are. They offer a potentially incredible value proposition to a market that is increasingly flooded with games at a time when consumers have a finite number of resources to spend on said games, whether it be time or money. They are competing for both of those things, and these aspects make them competitive in our current marketplace.
Will that change at some point in the future? Entirely possible. Will technology evolve past the point of favoring the roguelite, or will it indeed continue to empower the roguelite, as it did the roguelike, by moving away from such basic systems and graphical representations as ASCII? Which genre will we see the roguelite formula applied to next? I'm very interested to see. But of course, that holy grail, the final destination and goal for every roguelite has to be taking those principles and enhancing a genre entry with them rather than simply using them as a way to compensate for weaknesses elsewhere. A truly great roguelite will compete with a game in that genre that does not utilize the roguelite pillars. When you can do that, then you've got a truly great experience. We don't see it very often. And even if a game doesn't necessarily achieve that goal, it can still be good in and of its own right, and many are. But that's the apex. That's where everybody should be aiming their sights. And as more traditionally developed, narratively driven, scripted and linear games become progressively more expensive and complex to produce, more and more people are looking towards these principles as a business reality rather than merely a design one. My thoughts on roguelite, ladies and gentlemen, and the nature of genre in video games. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, by all means, do feel free to click the like button. If not, the dislike button is right over there. And I'll see you next time.